Hello everyone, this is Professor Keen. Today we'll be continuing our discussion of Benjamin Franklin's 1762 letter to Mr. Kinnersley. This is from A Student's Guide to the Great Physics Texts, Chapter 4, in Volume 3. You might recall that in our last lecture, we did a review of Franklin's, um, some of the historical context in which Franklin was working. Specifically, we talked about how the idea that objects are filled with some electrical fire, which is kind of like a fluid, and if you rub them, it can produce a lack of equilibrium. It can cause electrical fire to accumulate in certain objects and a deficit of electrical fire in other objects. So those become respectively positively and negatively electrified according to Benjamin Franklin. And then Nolet, another scientist, said what basically happens is nature tries to reestablish this equilibrium by recombining this, what Benjamin Franklin would call positive and negatively charged objects. Now, while this sounds pretty good at first, Benjamin Franklin notices that there's a, a, a critical problem with this. In particular, it implies only attractive forces. As equilibrium is, equilibrium is attempted to be reestablished in nature, positive and negative charges are attracted to one another. But it doesn't really explain repulsion. So he finds repulsion very difficult to explain on this theory. So on page 52 of the textbook, this is again within this letter from, uh, I'm sorry, 1762, what Benjamin Franklin does is he goes through some of the experimental observations that he that he makes that, that illustrate that nature seems to um, demonstrate repulsive forces. So let's go through some of these experiments. This again is on page 52 of the text. So I'll call this, he doesn't number them, but I'll call this experiment number one. And I'm not going to draw an entire apparatus. I'm just going to draw the critical parts of an apparatus. So in experiment one, he mentions, imagine you have a conductor. So a conducting ball, like a metal ball with a metal rod. And imagine a metal, um, kind of a metal plate or something sticking to the bottom. And hanging from this metal object are two threads with cork balls. Okay, so these are cork balls. And this up here, along with all this, is metal. It's a conductor. That's the important part. And this, of course, is supported somehow, but I'm not drawing the supports. And these balls are hanging straight down. And what he mentions is that if now you take a glass rod, let's say, let me draw a glass rod, and you charge up this glass rod by rubbing it by friction so that it becomes, as he would call it, positively charged, and you bring it nearby this metal ball with the metal support right here and these silk balls, what will happen to these silk balls is they will repel each other like this. Okay. So as you bring this near to that metal, these silk balls, I'm sorry, these cork balls will repel each other. And then if you remove this glass rod from the vicinity of this object, then what happens is these cork balls will swing back toward each other. Okay, so you pull this away and these swing back toward each other and are no longer repelled. So he's, he says this is a case where you bring this nearby, they swing apart from each other. Why does this happen? Well, it's um, he says it's a bit confusing because you're not actually touching this to it. All you're bringing, doing is bringing this nearby, and when you bring this nearby, these repel each other. Now, what he's suggesting happens here, and we'll explain this in a bit more detail in a moment, but what he's suggesting happening is this positive, positively charged object, again, it has an excess of this electrical fire in it, it repels the electrical fire that's on this side of the metal down into here, which renders these objects positively charged and this negatively charged. So whatever equilibrium electrical fluid is in here, it's pushed away by this positive charge, leaving negative charge here and positive charge over there, and these positive charges repel each other. So in a sense, you're polarizing. So there's a polarization of the apparatus. And by apparatus, I mean this thing right here. This whole thing right here is the apparatus, OK? This, by the way, is a principle of how an electrometer works. He doesn't use the term electrometer, but an electrometer tests whether an object you bring near to it is positively charged by having some very light balls or maybe some gold foil hanging down here that swings apart. Okay, And then when you pull this away, the positive charge on this end, negative charge on this end, then equilibrate, the whole thing becomes neutral, and they swing back together. Okay, So that's how he explains what's happening here. What about his next experiment? We'll call this experiment two. It's very similar in that you have a glass rod that is positively charged and you bring this glass rod nearby the same apparatus 
And when you do so, these balls swing apart from one another, like this. And again, I'll, I'll draw pictures to illustrate what he thinks is going on in here. These positive charges repel these positive charges, leaving negative charge right here. And then he says, let's t imagine while this is held nearby, so I'm going to redraw this. While this is held nearby, let's suppose you were to take your finger, uh, let me draw the glass rod once again. You brought it nearby, it's positively charged. You take your finger and you touch this end. So this is supposed to be your finger. You touch this end right here. So this is supposed to be your finger. You make contact right there. And when you make contact, what happens, because you're standing on the ground, so maybe I'll just draw that you're attached to the ground, and your body's a conductor, because by virtue of the fact that you have moisture inside of your body, so you're providing an attachment to ground, and when you do that, these balls swing back together so that they're hanging straight down, because then they are neutral. Okay? But what's happening, he suggests, is that this positive charge is still right here. It's pushing this electrical fire down through your hand into the ground, and so this end of the rod is still negatively charged, although this is neutral, it's just that the earth has a little bit of extra positive charge in it, because this, um, because you're pushing the fluid down through here, the earth is so big that a little bit of extra positive charge still makes earth essentially in equilibrium, okay? Then what you do is you move your hand away, you remove your hand, and then you remove, you remove that glass rod, and what happens, so you momentarily touch, momentarily touch with your finger, which neutralizes these. And then after touching it, you move your hand away. And then what happens when you move that glass rod away, you move away the glass rod. And then what he notices is that these balls once again swing apart. Okay, why is that? Well, because when you move your hand away, the negative charge is up here, and that negative charge then redistributes throughout this entire thing. So it's a little bit ne less negative charge up here, but overall this whole thing is negatively charged, and that is precisely why these balls repel one another. After you remove the glass rod. So the, the excess of negative charge that's in this end right here of this electrometer Granted, this down here is neutral when you touch it, but after you remove your finger, this has, still has a little bit of extra negative charge. This redistributes itself. These become negatively charged, and they repel one another. Okay. So those are the first two experiments he carries out. And the explanation, once again, that he provides, so let's talk about Franklin's explanation, is that the positive electrification of the charged rod the charged glass rod had repelled it repelled the electrical fire as he would call it away from itself away from the rod the charged rod into the opposite end end of the and again, he doesn't call it this, but we'll call it, it this, the electrometer, okay? And the implication, he says, is that um, there is repulsion, there exists repulsion, a repulsive force, a repulsive character to electrical phenomena, not merely an attractive character, okay? And then he goes on to mention that repulsion or repulsive forces do appear elsewhere in nature. So this really isn't so surprising. So repulsive forces appear elsewhere. So this is, in other words, the idea that there might be repulsion in electrical phenomena isn't really that surprising because repulsive forces appear elsewhere in nature. This is, he's going through some of these on page 52. He mentions that heated water expands and also... So heated water expands into steam, which seems to imply a repulsion. Uh, Gunpowder explodes, 
By the way, I think I suspect that there's an influence of Isaac Newton on Benjamin Franklin. Isaac Newton had written his work on optics and his um, work on his Principia, uh, his work on uh, gravity, a bit earlier, where he talks about these repulsive forces on an atomic level. And I suspect that Benjamin Franklin was influenced by the work of Isaac Newton that was maybe 50, 40 or 50 years earlier. And he also mentions that similar magnetic poles repel one another. So these are all instances of repulsive forces. So if repulsive forces appear elsewhere in nature, then why shouldn't they appear in electricity? Um, he also mentions if you take a, a little vein, okay, with points on it, think about a little metal vein point, and you stick it on a needle and put it on top of a positively charged object, this will spin around, okay, so it will spin this way. And he says it spins around because this vein becomes positively charged. And because it's a needle, it throws out little positive charges from the end of it. And those positive charges repel the positive charges that are being supplied to the points. So I know I'm drawing this really tiny, but there's positive charges here. They eject positive charges. Those repel each other, and that's what causes it to spin around. And this doesn't matter whether you charge this thing positively or negatively. I'm imagining like a big ball that's positively charged. If you put this little vein on top of a negatively charged object as well. Well, that becomes negatively charged and it draws an electrical fire here. So there's negative charge in the air right near the points and those negative charges repel the negative charges. And once again, it will spin around. So he gives these as more um, examples of repulsive forces, but this one specifically has to do with electrical phenomena. Okay. Um, and Remember that Nolet's theory that Franklin is criticizing here. He's saying Nolet's theory was that quantities of different densities mutually attract each other in order to restore equilibrium. And Benjamin Franklin says that this theory is not really well founded. Although it is true that if you distort this electrical fire, it does attempt to reestablish equilibrium. It doesn't fully explain the phenomena. So Nolet's theory of Nolet's theory, and this is on page 53, about the middle of page 53, that um, that nature um, attempts to restore equilibrium. Equilibrium is at the very least incomplete. It works to some extent, but it's incomplete. And I think one of the neatest experiments to illustrate this is the next experiment that Benjamin Franklin talks about. So let me briefly mention that. This is once again on page 53 of the text. This is similar to the previous two that I had just mentioned, where you have an electrometer. Well, you actually don't even need an electrometer, but let's just draw it like this. Let's have a couple of spheres that are charged up so that they're repelling one another. And specifically, let's say, so these are positively charged. I'm just going to attach a number to this. To this will help illustrate the point. Let's suppose this is charged up so it has a charge plus 2. Don't worry about the units. Just say it's doubly charged. And this one is plus 2 as well. So they are repelled from one another by virtue of both being positively charged. Okay. And now, let's suppose, he says, you take these two balls, and while they're repelled from one another, you take another ball that's the exact same size and you bring it nearby and you touch it. So you touch it to one of the balls. Touch an identical ball to the right ball. And when you do this, some of the charge that had been on this one then gets transferred over to this one. Well, So while this one still retains a plus two charge, now when you touch it, this one will now have plus one charge and this one will have plus one charge. It kind of equilibrates by contact and so they both have a plus one charge. Okay, and let me, just for clarity, label this ball A, label this ball B, this is still ball A, this one is ball B, and this one is ball C. Okay, now you pull these apart from each other and you notice, he says, that now because this one has lost some of its charge, they still repel one another, but not quite so much. Okay, so they're still repelled. This one has a charge plus two, it's positive. This one has a charge plus one, it's positive. So they're still repelling each other. So just like they had been repelling each other here, they're still repelling each other here, but it's not quite so much as over here. Okay, you pull this one away right here. This one has a charge plus one, it's positively charged. And here is the point that he makes, the important point. He says that A and B repel each other, and 
ball C, importantly, he points out that ball A and ball C still repel one another. Balls A and C now repel one another. Why is this important that balls A and C repel one another? Well, when C was neutral, you would think that they would try to attract one another, okay? And they actually do, because C can get polarized by A. But more importantly, we know that ball C now is positively charged, and ball A is positively charged, but ball A has a plus two charge, and C only has a plus one charge. So they are out of equilibrium with one another. And if Nolet's theory is correct, that they try to reestablish equilibrium, then A and C should attract one another, right? Because ball A has more of this positive charge than C. They're out of equilibrium. By Nolet's theory, they should attract. But we find that balls A and C repel one another, which seems to suggest that this purely equilibrating or attractive force is not complete in explaining these phenomena. And this is something that Benjamin Franklin points out. So if any objects that are out of equilibrium attract one another, then balls A and C should attract each other, but they don't, they repel. Okay, and so let me just finish this off by mentioning some of Franklin's final comments at the end of this section. So on page 53, um, Franklin suggests that electrical fluid is attracted strongly by all other kinds of matter that we know of, while the parts of the fluid mutually repel each other. So that's how he kind of understands what's going on. And then at the very end of this, he kind of provides a strategy for future research. He says, and I'll quote him, he says, opinions are continually varying where we cannot have mathematical evidence of the nature of things. And they must vary, opinions must vary. Nor is that variation without its use, he says, since it occasions a more thorough discussion whereby error is often dissipated and true knowledge is increased. So Benjamin Franklin recognizes that in his non-quantitative experiments, very qualitative experiments, where he's trying to understand the nature of electricity, it would be it would benefit greatly from a more quantitative approach. And that's what's precisely going to happen in our next reading when we study the work of Coulomb, Charles Coulomb, where he takes a quantitative approach to trying to understand the force of repulsion between charged objects. Before we go into the work of Charles Coulomb, let's just finish out our work with Benjamin Franklin by talking about his work with the kite. And we will pick that up next time.